This giant rope creature perplexed us all as he sort of dabbed us onto the cliff before the Fountainhead Palace. While it's mentioned in no item descriptions, we can actually make an educated guess about what he represents. So let's tie a knot in it, once and for I'm so sorry about the pun. A shimanawa, or enclosing rope, is a length of hemp or rice straw that's commonly found woven around Tori gates, Shinto shrines, and also sacred landmarks. They're here to act as a sort of ward against evil spirits, or to indicate passage into a pure sacred space. Quite a few of these exist in-game. For example, there's the gate right before the valley that houses the sacred serpent god, and since the divine dragon looks about 20 times as divine as the serpent god, I guess they needed a bigger rope for the divine realm. Blocking our way to said realm, however, is the real corrupted monk. A warrior woman who guards the Vermilion Bridge. So, one thing that marks female warriors as of the Okami clan is a vulnerability to Sabimaru's poison. She doesn't have that vulnerability, but what she does have is the signature laugh and movement of the Okami, which marks her as a part of their clan, but perhaps she's not a part of their bloodline. Anyway, she has some really fascinating additions to her character compared to the rest of the Okami. First and foremost, she's infested, hence she's immortal, and this happened to be a quality that the Fountainhead thought would be quite appropriate for an eternal watcher of their palace. Her true name is Priestess Yao, and this is a name that user Sarumaro on Reddit thinks is a reference to Yao Bikuni, a fisherman's daughter who became immortal after eating the flesh of a Ningyo. And I completely agree with this theory. So a Ningyo is best translated to mermaid for those of us in the West, though more accurately it's described as a fish creature with shining scales, a humanoid face, and the mouth of a monkey. In the story of Yao Bikuni, she eats the flesh of the Ningyo, and those who do so are said to be blessed with incredible longevity. And this is what happened to Yao Bikuni, who, in the story, went on to become a wandering immortal priestess. So there's clearly a parallel here to Priestess Yao, the corrupted monk, which leads me to believe that Priestess Yao may have eaten immortal Ningyo flesh as well. Because the Divine Dragon, in fact, is called the Ningyo Dragon in the game's hidden files. And related to the Divine Dragon through a Chinese legend are the Great Carp. The Great Carp are also a type of Ningyo. They're a fish with human origins, because the pot nobles all aspire to become a great carp. If you ever happen across another pot like mine, ignore any requests he makes of you. He's the shame of our clan. He's a treasonous villain who attempted to kill the great carp for his own benefit. Thus, there have been many great carp over the years, and you can find their corpses littering the Fountainhead lake bed. All of these rotting corpses are a sort of testament to the ambition, the backstabbing, and the desperation of the pot nobles to become eternal. Soon, I will be a car, and as age withers you away, as you sit powerless in the face of eternity, I will be the new great car. Curiously, one such corpse is infested with luminescent centipede creatures, which may well explain the infestation of Priestess Yao if she did indeed eat the Ningyo's flesh like her namesake did. So this is a really strong theory to think it could be this Japanese legend about eating the flesh of the Ningyo, which is the missing puzzle piece to us understanding where the infestation comes from. And at the very least, it is the Fountainhead rejuvenating waters that spread the infestation throughout all of Ashina, as many of the infested have clearly drank deeply of these waters. Near the infested corpse of the Great Carp is the fallen spirit of Yashariku, who haunts the bottom of the lake. So the Headless are ruined forms of Ashina's heroes, and Yashariku in particular has a really interesting story. So, he died to the palace nobles, but 
his spiritful states that he might not have had his twin been at his side. Alas, his twin was lost in childbirth, which goes on to explain why we lose half our health when using his item, and why a second apparition fights beside him below the lake. He was never quite whole, even after death. Much of the architecture below the lake has become uninhabitable thanks to the overflow of divine water, and there's no one here capable of rebuilding this because their civilization is now literally comprised of a warrior caste in the Okami and a noble caste with the palace nobles. And even more of their area is in the process of being destroyed by the great carp. So placating the carp has become a necessity. This explains our slug harvest discussion in the last episode, and all of those slugs likely end up here in the hands of the great carp attendant. My father is now a noble, and the moment he became one, he found himself entranced by a carp, the great carp. For a long, long time since, he's done nothing but feed that cursed carp. Young man, please release my father from the carp's bewitching powers. I know my father wouldn't wish for an eternity like that. So their father became a noble in the lifetime of these two daughters. So it follows that these women might have been some of the last to come through here from Mibu village. They're the only remaining humans we find in this place. And they're so old now that they've basically become all but invisible to the palace nobles because they no longer have any youth to drain. Young man, please be careful. The palace nobles have a craving for the vitality of youth. They can't help themselves. They want nothing but to sap away more and more of it. For generations, wedding processions were led from Mibu village leading to the Divine Realm, which was an honor that was bestowed only upon those who could master the Mibu technique of breathing underwater. And when they arrived, the wedding procession was allegedly given water of the palace, which can then turn you into a noble, and then you would be fit to become a citizen of the palace. Or were you? Because behind locked doors, in a dark room that leads up to the Fountainhead Peak, there are these red nobles of the palace, whose outfits likely denote their higher rank. And here, they feast upon the corpses of the Okami. And they do so while right behind them lie a set of white wedding palanquins. Palanquins that surely belonged to the wedding processions derived from Meibu village. And if they had no problem devouring their own kind, then they certainly wouldn't have a problem draining the life force of those coming from Mibu village. And if they had no problem killing them, then the very least of their concerns would be the great carp attendant, who they tricked into performing a really undignified task. You... you beasts! You tricked him all this time! Nobility this, and eternity that! Pretty lies to fool him! Give him back! Father! My father! Give him back! <laughs> so, as Fountainhead culture descended down a really dark path, it's no surprise that Tomoe and Takedo saw fit to leave. So these two are basically mirror images of Sekiro and Kuro. They're a divine child and their guardian, just like us. Except that Tomoe and Takeru descended from the Fountainhead and then began to mingle with the Ashina elites. Back then, Lord Genichiro and I would come here a lot. Lord Takeru would play the flute and Lady Tomoe would dance under the Ever Blossom. It was a wonderful sight. Note that just as Takeru played the flute of the palace nobles, so too did Tomoe dance like the Okami of the Fountainhead. It's a cool little detail. That day beneath the branches of the Ever Blossom tree, Lady Tomoe tried to commit suicide. 
Why? She said, those made immortal by the oath of the dragon's heritage shackle their masters. So in order for the purification to occur, the oath-bound of the dragon's heritage must die? Yes, precisely. Speaking of the oath-bound, one trait of those touched by the divine dragon appears to be this streak of white atop one's scalp. Sekiro has it, Kudo has it, Kudo 2.0 has it, hell, even the Okami warrior women have it, but none have it more than the purple garbed lightning bearer atop the great Sakura tree. Her hair is pure white, perhaps a testament to the age of these eternal beings that were blessed by the divine dragon. And it bears mentioning that the actual name of the divine dragon in Japanese is the Sakura dragon, which is a name that suits it way better when you consider the nature of the Sakura tree. These cherry blossoms, if you didn't know, they only bloom for one week in an entire year. It's this period of exquisite beauty that sadly cannot last, but is all the more beautiful for it. To the Japanese, this symbolizes an acceptance of destiny, karma, and mortality, and this balance is really usurped and turned kind of unnatural in Sekiro because the Sakura here bloom permanently. And this is, of course, thanks to the Sakura dragon who drifted here from the west, and he probably was lost until he discovered Japan, which luckily also had Sakura trees, and he decided to settle in this fertile land, which forced the lesser gods out. And I've spoken of these lesser gods before, since it's possible that the lesser gods are the serpent god and Buddha, who were once a part of this region. But I should really also be mentioning the white dragons of the tree, these wizened little dudes that also fit the description. Their faces can be found on the architecture of the palace. Thus, I think it's likely that they were actually here before the dragon took root. They are of the tree, after all, and I reckon these little gods were merged with the divinity of the Sakura dragon when he made their tree his own. And we mentioned the white hair of the Oathbound as well, something that is also seen with the old dragons. They have become this really sickly white, literally too, because they are very sick. In contrast to the black dragons, these white dragons are a representation of dragon rot and the stagnation that's afflicting us all, and it's actually the act of killing these white dragons that purges the affliction from the tree, which causes it to blossom, which causes the Sakura dragon to rouse itself back to life. And the first thing we notice with the dragon is that it's terribly wounded, and there are some interesting theories on this as well. So first, it could be wounded because it's showing the effects of dragon rot, or maybe it had these wounds before when it was cut free from the west and drifted to Japan. Or an even better theory, it's possible that these wounds the dragon has mirror the wounds that we, Sekiro and Kudo also have sustained. We are of the dragon's blood after all, and just like the dragon has lost its left arm, we have as well. And just like the dragon has a gash on its chest, Kudo also cut himself with the mortal blade when he drew blood for the Fountainhead Fragrance. Another really likely theory is that maybe it sustained these wounds during an earlier fight, and the best candidate for a fight against the Divine Dragon is Tomoe, who would have fought the dragon for its dragon's tears. And Tomoe may have also been the original owner of the second mortal blade, the Black Blade. It's easy to complete Sekiro without really realizing that the Black Blade exists, but it is a supremely important item for explaining the story. Its real name is Open Gate, a weapon with the power to open a gate to the underworld which, if you didn't know, is what happens at the end of the game, when Genichiro summons his grandfather back in his prime to defeat you. And its description has one final line, one that reads, I beseech you, make offerings for the dragon's blood. This links the weapon to the divine dragon, and while it's the most sinister example of the divine dragon wanting an offering, it's not the only example of offerings, 
the Okami dance as an offering, the Mibu were brought here as marital offerings. Those of the Fountainhead had a practice of cutting spirit emblems from their flesh with a ceremonial knife. And there's also a shrine maiden here who has passed away praying at the dragon's shrine. And then there's the Black Blade, which was allegedly used for offerings as well. And now let me explain why the Black Blade would have belonged to Tomoe. First, we know that Tomoe wanted to sever immortality, and for this, she needed the tears of the Divine Dragon. However, while the Black Blade could wound the Divine Dragon, it couldn't impart its tears, and for this she would need the Red Mortal Blade, which is actually named the Gracious Gift of Tears. It's designed for this purpose, but unfortunately for her, it was hidden away by the Senpo High Priest, and no matter what Tomoe tried, she could not get him to reveal its whereabouts. And she did try to get it, which puts her at odds with the Divine Dragon. Second, those Tomoe was closest to in Ashina ended up knowing a lot about the Black Blade. A scroll describing it is left outside of Ishin's quarters. Genichiro trained under Tomoe and later managed to find the Black Blade. And Takeru wrote of beheading with the Mortal Blade, an act that Genichiro performs with the Black Blade at the end of the game. My point here is that Tomoe influenced the lives of so many people, and it's crazy to imagine that we might not learn more about her in the future. This series took a long time to make, so if you enjoyed it, please consider checking out avatividya.com, where you can find this ever-growing collection of Souls-inspired merch designs. Our latest piece is The Fate of Kings by John Devlin, available in red bronze or black and white line art. As a special promotion, if you enter code TSORG10 at checkout, you'll get 10% off, but only if you order in the next two days. Not many of you are still listening at this point in the video, but I gotta get something off my chest. This episode marks the end of the five-part series, and this explains the majority of Sekiro's story. This was a really lore heavy episode, I know not everyone can stick through these long heavy episodes, but I'm actually quite proud of this series, uh, which is rare for me to say, um, because I feel like this series uncovered a lot of lore that has never been written about online before, and I think this series will stand as a really good resource for people looking to uncover the deeper meaning that the game has. And the game does have a deeper meaning, obviously, you know that, but a lot of people don't know that because unlike something like Dark Souls, people don't look for the deeper meaning in Sekiro because Sekiro already has a really obvious surface level story. But the depth is there, and it's good, and I hope you share it with some other people. So I'm happy that I could bring some of that to light, and I'm happy that there's some of you who are still listening who clearly appreciate that story too. So thank you for being a part of this, and I'll see you next time.